Dear friends, welcome to ePartshala. I am Dr. Vishal Jadav, Department of Sociology, Tilak Maharashtra Vidya Peet Pune. Today we are going to look at a module titled Violence Against Women, Feminism and Politics, which is part of the Political Sociology paper. As the title suggests, this module will try and understand how within the patriarchal structure that was constructed through the colonial episteme of the public and the private, of the East and the West, of the I and the other, of the spiritual and the material, how the feminists have located their discourse of misogyny and how they have located this whole debate about violence against and control over their bodies in this patriarchal structure. This module will try and assess this in two periods, which the first period would be in the pre-independence period that talks about women's movement and then in the second period since the 1970s how the feminist movements began to grow and how they began to branch out into different movements. Pre-independence women's movements. The past is replete with examples of women's revolutionaries. As early as 1882, Swarna Kumari Devi started the Ladies Theosophical Society, a multi-religious association for women while her daughter Sarla Devi trained women in the use of weaponry. Pandita Ramabai, delegate to the Indian National Congress in 1889, established women's organizations and schools for girls. In 1910, Sarla Devi Chaudhrani founded Bharat's Three Mahamandal, arguing against men who preached reforms but endorsed Manu's patriarchal laws. In 1918, the All India Muslim Ladies Conference passed a resolution against polygamy. Women's Indian Association of 1917, National Council of Indian Women 1925, and All India Women's Conference 1927 practiced petition politics to promote feminist issues. They all demanded votes for women, for equality with men, arguing that women voters and legislators could help in ushering in social reform, morality in politics, as well as raising a generation of healthy, educated citizens. In fact, Sarojini Naidu urged women to utilize their housekeeping skills to put the national house in order. When the South Borough Committee toured India, women groups proceeded to show numerical support for their demands. In Bombay, the committee was presented with a petition signed by 800 educated women and statements supporting women's suffrage from the All India Women's Delegation, the Bharat Stri Mandal Home Rule League, in a similar instance, when Muslim men sought to be exempted from the Hindu marriage bill in 1927, the Muslim women members of Women's Indian Association presented a special petition opposing it. Its lead petitioner, Sharifa Hamid Ali, had later in 1930 launched a drive for delegate divorce, demanding that women can initiate divorce without losing their meher. This was also a period of reform initiatives by M.G. Ranade and Rajara Monroy to curb practices of female infanticide, sati and child marriage. Eager to counteract the British critique of Indian culture, reformers saw women's emancipation as critical to nationalist regeneration. But an upper class, upper caste bias oriented their reforms. This was evident in the issues that were not given their due importance like inheritance rights, domestic violence or polygamy. Anything that disturbed the patriarchal hold over the private sphere. For instance, sections of the Hindu Court Bill, which legalized intercaste marriage and enabled divorce, were definitely not welcomed with open arms and were viewed with great hostility. Moreover, Patha Chatterjee had analyzed the nationalist resolution of the women's question, which was done by outlining the two spheres of culture as material and spiritual. These two separate spheres, identified as Bahir, world and Ghar, home, were aligned with gender roles. Women were supposed to occupy the latter and hence were distinguished from the common lower class female. Sharmila Regi argues that as such Dalit and working class women were precluded from the discussion. Barring a few progressive legislations targeting social evils like child marriage, the colonial state furthered patriarchal interests stemming from administrative expediency. 
The independence struggle witnessed a surge of participation. On Gandhi's encouragement, thousands of women joined the civil disobedience movement in 1930. Sarojini Naidu, Lado Rani Jutsi, Rani Gudialo, Kamla Nehru, Hans Mehta, Ankita Bai Gokhale and others vigorously participated in Satyagraha, braving the, braving the violent onslaught of the colonial army. Nari Satyagraha Samiti, Mahila Rashtra Sangh, Sri Swaraj Sangh and Swayam Sevika Sangh boycotted foreign cloth and liquor. Dalit women also played an important role in the movement spearheaded by Ambedkar and Phule in Maharashtra. Anasuya, Sarabhai, Mani Ben Kara, Ushabai Dange, Parvati Bhore, part of the labor movement worked for amelioration of textile mill and railway workers. However, problematic values of male guardianship underlined Congress-led nationalism, which threatened to overwhelm women's issues. It soon became apparent that the nationalists were not interested in the women's empowerment. By 1940s, another dilemma cropped up for women's organizations. In the run-up to the Special Reservation for Women campaign, they faced resistance from nationalist leaders. In young India, Gandhi argued that women should take their place beside men, but a vote for women campaign would end up distracting attention from the freedom struggle. Following this, Begum Shah Nawaz's recommendation to accept special reservation as an interim measure was refused by others during the 1930 Roundtable Conference. Moreover, in 1941, when the Rao Committee's proposal to reform the Hindu law was opposed by the Congress, women leaders who had initially thought otherwise joined the boycott on the insistence of Gandhi and Murudala Sarabhai. From then onwards, they became fully committed to the freedom struggle, sidelining their initial concerns with gender equality. According to Samita Sen, by the 1940s, all India women's organization no longer had any political influence since the ideology too, ideology became too middle class, too Hindu and urban to appeal to the impoverished sisters. While there was a significant turnout of peasant and working class for class-based action and nationalist movement led by the left, for instance, the Tebaga movement, the independent women's organizations failed to mobilize them for their campaigns on gender issues. The alliance between the All India Women's Conference and Indian National Congress proved to be a drawback since the identification of oppressive male agency became muted. As such, the focus shifted to the system and not men, which in turn suited the latter's welfare orientation. Post-independence, the 1950s witnessed a wave of euphoria and optimism regarding the future, particularly the promise of economic growth, benefits trickling down. Upper and middle class women absorbed into the ranks of a welfare government and women's organizations that became institutionalized uncritically accepted this goal. However, left-oriented women's groups were either skeptical of the constitutional guarantees and promises of prosperity. Therefore, the National Federation of Indian Women was born in, 18, in 1954. In 1960, several industrial workers, wage and unionization struggles emerged with witness enormous participation from women. However, the forum on which women's grievances could be discussed was still lacking. Thus, there appeared to be a lull in feminist activity until the 1970s when an entire new generation of women launched a reinvigorated radical movement once again. Feminist engagement with civil society. The 1970s marked a turning point in women's movement since there was a resurgence of feminist consciousness. For instance, the Shahada movement of 1972, Abhil landless laborer struggle against exploitative landlords, landowners was taken over by women who confronted issues like domestic violence and alcoholism. In 1972, Self-Employed Women's Association was established to ameliorate working conditions of women in the informal sector. Mrinal Gore and Ahilya Rangnekar initiated the anti-price rice agitation in 1973, mobilizing several women who would beat plates with rolling pins to protest. In 1974, progressive organization of women emerged out of the Maoist movement whose women cadres united against gender oppression and questioned the sexual division of labor. The Nav Nirman movement of 1974 in Gujarat initially involving students against inflation later attracted women who criticized the state conducting hunger strikes and arranging mock courts to pass judgments on corrupt officials. Mahila Samta Sainik Dal 
drew parallels between anti caste agitations and feminism stressing oppression of religion and caste following the report towards equality the united nations proclaimed the year 1975 as international women's year simultaneously disillusionment had set in against the left parties which were gradually losing the radicalism and were insensitive to women's issues focused exclusively on class issues they ignored patriarchy and domestic violence perpetrated by working class men in fact the left was questioned by a peasant woman why should my comrade beat me at home hence some associates left behind the left party affiliations and became autonomous milestones in feminist movement a major landmark in the feminist history was the anti dowry campaign dating back to the 1970s although the progressive organization of women organized a protest as early as 1975 it was a sudden death of a young woman tarvinder kaur due to dowry harassment which initiated full fledged feminist crusade against dowry mahila dakshata samiti nari raksha samiti stri sangharsh samiti stri sangharsh under the banner of dahej virodhi chetna manch started a spate of demonstrations to raise public awareness about the evils of dowry the family was asserted as the site for women's oppression and not a safe refuge from the cruel world as commonly presumed in addition they recorded the last words of the dying women took family testimony and encouraged friends and neighbors to come forward with their evidence the campaign was hugely successful in overcoming the indifference towards dowry harassment highlighting that many of the so called suicides were in fact murders this encouraged more families to come out in the open with their dowry harassment cases the anti rape agitation was another milestone as it was orchestrated by feminist groups across india led led by lotika sarkar of forum against rape the growing incidence of rapes by police and landlords especially the infamous mathura ramiza b and maya tyagi case galvanized the feminists into action the mathura case in particular urged the feminists to declare 8 march 1980 as the day of deliverance demanding a retrial implementation of relevant sections of the indian penal code and changes in the law against rape the campaign against rape marked a new stage in the development of feminism in india networks which had begun to form in 1978 were now being consolidated and expanded and used to coordinate action at the same time through joint action feminism began to be drawn into mainstream political activism since it garnered plenty of media attention the campaign saw the entry of national political parties the maya tyagi case not only invited sharp reactions from feminist groups but also from parties like lokdal cpi and congress prominent leaders like khan abdul ghafar khan and jagjeevan ram demanded capital punishment and shifting the onus of proof on onto the accused Furthermore it provoked a stirring of reflexivity among feminists as to whether or not the campaign should be waged sidestepping the subject's wishes during deliberations on the anti rape law by the law commission a fierce debate raged at the left feminist conference in bombay in 1978 where the bone of contention was the extension of burden of proof clause opinions remained divided those who propose such as stri sangharsh and lawyers collective that it be extended to cover all kinds of rape and those who opposed it stri shakti sangathana arguing that it would provide a convenient pretext for the state to convict male activists in false rape cases accusations were lev- levied against each side of being anti feminist belittling the horrors of rape or being bourgeoisie idolists unconcerned with the larger political issues and realities on the ground even the rural area saw a spurt of feminist consciousness women were part of chhatra yuva sangharsh vahini a movement in both gaya to reclaim land from the temple priest in karim nagar women active in the landless labor struggle agitated against the rapes by landlords and wife beating in 1980 patna bore witness to a demonstration by women students against the rape of a rickshaw puller's wife the anti rape campaign was successful on several fronts rape was no longer an issue to be brushed under the carpet 
custodial rape received legal recognition and the definition of rape itself was scrutinized. For instance, the People's Union of Democratic Rights found that most of the custodial rapes were used to punish women who eloped with men their families did not approve of. The success of the anti-rape and anti-dowry campaigns had emboldened feminists to wage a protracted struggle against patriarchy. Moreover, the lessons learned particularly the need to limit the involvement of political parties helped improve upon the lacunae in their campaigns. Branching out. Gradually, the diversification of campaigns saw feminist foray into varied fields. In 1984, feminist organizations worked with victims of the Bhopal gas tragedy. Women groups also allied with medical organizations such as Medico Friends Circle or Voluntary Health Association of India to campaign against harmful pregnancy testing and conception of drugs. The most notable were the campaigns against Nathan and Depo Provera. During 1986-1987, feminists pleaded their case before the drug controller to investigate the drugs prescribed by doctors, arguing that the latter do so at the behest of the pharmaceutical companies. Multiple women's centers also sprung up in cities imparting legal aid, health care, counseling and even employment. Interestingly, some of these centers were named Sakhi Kendra and Saheli, signifying the application of feminist concepts of sisterhood to traditionally accepted structures of friendship among, among women as well as bringing out the positive aspects of women's lives. They often held workshops to celebrate women's creativity through song, drama and painting, thereby spawning a new definition of political activism. Feminist plays, Om Swaha, Mulgi Zaliho, and exhibition used traditional images of subordination to convey their message. They have been, they have even attempted to use traditional idioms of empowerment, immortalized by the slogan, Ham Bharat ki nari hai, fool nahi, chingari hai. Reinterpreting myths, epics, and folk tales, women were linked, likened to goddess Kali and women warriors, urging women to struggle for their rights. An alternative strategy was to look at local forms of resistance by women, such as through the pretense of de Devi possession, especially during pregnancy to get their demands accepted by their husbands, such as to get money for household expenses. Movements that appeared unrelated to women's issues began to be re-evaluated. For instance, Shipko movement was used to highlight the special connection between women and environment. In addition, while on one hand a consolidated network of women's journalists reporting on feminist concerns emerged, on the other hand the Center for Women's Development Studies and SNDT Women's University were established bringing women's issues into focus through its annual conferences. Over the years a group of fiery feminists has emerged vocal in the demands for women's rights. Veena Majumdar founded Center for Women's Development Studies, combining scholarly research with activism. Vandana Shiva pioneered eco-feminism, underlying, underlining the eco-friendly subsistence practices of women and critiquing capitalist patriarchy. Urvashi Butalia co-founded with Ritu Menon the first feminist publishing house Kali for Women. Kamla Basi established women's resource and training centers Sangat and Jagori. In December 2012, the Delhi gang rape case spread a ripple of angry murmurs across the country. Unprecedented participation in protest marches in Mumbai, Bangalore and Kochi prompted the media to call it India's Arab Spring Moment. The 1 billion rising campaign 14th February 2013 was launched in more than 15 states, promoting the idea of women empowerment through songs, street plays and poetry. In wake of the nationwide outrage, the Justice Verma Committee compiled a report in concurrence with women's group like Forum Against Oppression of Women, Jagori, Women Against Sexual Violence and State Repression. The committee outlines a Bill of Rights for Women wherein the state shall commit itself to provide right to life, security and bodily integrity for women. The committee in particular directed its attention towards the police as an area of much needed reforms. It noted that the police are not guided by the principle of the constitution or the rule of law, but routinely act as arbitrators of honor or shame, being all women who wish to lodge complaints of rape or sexual assaults as essentially shameless. More importantly, it redefined consent 
ensuring that passivity, passivity under shock or trauma is not construed as consent. While inaction by senior public servants, police, armed forces is liable for punishment, the committee also recommends amending the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Furthermore, the Supreme Court re-examined the constitutional validity of the provision providing the definitions of juvenile, particularly in wake of the alleged brutality committed by one of the perpetrators. In another sexual assault case, Ayar Kamduni, West Bengal, women activists, activist groups like Nari Chetana, Manch and Maitri demanded justice for the victim as well as accountability from the government. Some of the activists even had to court arrest. Similarly, women's groups like Alochna have waged a protracted struggle against sexual harassment. As early as the 1980s, the Forum Against Oppression of Women took up the cause of sexual harassment suffered at workplace including PhD students persevering even in the face of adverse media publicity. During the 1990s, the brutal gang rape of Bhavri Devi, a government employee who tried to prevent child marriages, provoked women's group to push for a progressive law culminating in the Vishaka guidelines of 1997. The sexual harassment of women at workplace law enforced in 2013 was the outcome of deliberations by the National Commission for Women in consultation with several women's organizations. When a sexual harassment case was filed against a former Supreme Court judge by an interim feminist activist, activist like Vishaka Group for Women's Education and Research, Women's Rehabilitation Group, Jagori and Kali for Women pleaded to be interveners in the case. In another case involving the harassment of Ugandan women by certain authorities in Delhi, Kavita Krishnan of A AIDWA, Indu Agnihotri, Center for Women's Development Studies and Annie Raja, National Federation of Indian Women strongly condemned the incident and insisted that the guilty be brought to book. The Slut Walk or Besharmi Morcha too has been initiated by some women activists like Rita Banerjee as a mark of protest against the patriarchal assumption about blaming rapes on women's clothes. In 1999, it documented and analyzed the diverse civil and family laws applied to Muslims. Steps headed by Daud Sharifa Khannam questions the Jamaat's authority, traditionally headed by men, to decide matters concerning women. Divorce, dowry, domestic violence, custody. Hence, it intends to replace the extant Jamaat with one consisting of women members. It currently plans to erect a mosque exclusively for women and open a center for research on Islamic jurisprudence. Among tribal women, Nari Mukti, Mukti Samaj ensures food security for families in Malkangiri. In, Mahar, in Maharajor village, Samaj Vikas Mahila Samiti tackles the problem of water scarcity by rallying for construction of a dam in the region. There also emerged a discourse of dissent from mainstream feminism. Dalit feminism challenged the urban and middle class character of the women. The National Federation of Dalit Women and All India Dalit Forum argued that feminists homogenized their issues, ignoring patriarchal domination suffered by Dalit women. The left parties, from which most feminists hailed during the 1980s, were in particular blinded by their obsessive concerns with the materialist framework. As such, the anti-rape, anti-dowry, anti-violence struggles were waged against class caste factor, which adds to the severity of sexual violence hardly figured in the analysis of rape. For, a, for instance, the National Federation of Indian Women attributed the Mathura rape case to class, thus excluding the sexual ass assaults on Dalit women in Marathwada during the Namantar agitation. Even dowry cases were conceptualized outside the framework of Brahmanization. While the left party based women's organizations like National Federation of Indian Women collapsed caste into class, the autonomous women's groups collapsed caste into sisterhood, both leaving Brahminism unchallenged. Hence, they insisted on an independent identity, denying the chance to mainstream feminists to speak on their behalf. Such assertions hark back to pre independence era. Savitri Phule, Tarabai Shinde and Muktabai had written about the deprivations of their lands, their barriers to knowledge 
the commodification of the bodies as well as the patriarchy inherent not only among the Brahmins but also the non-Brahmins. Women actively took part in the Mahad Satyagraha, lent their support to the Independent Labour Party and the Scheduled Caste Federation as well as attending conferences where they passed resolutions against Brahmanical practices, child marriage, enforced widowhood and dowry. In Akola region, there was sustained activism by Dalit Mahila Mandals, especially expressed through the compositions Ovi and Palana that were rich in political content. In 1990s, heralded the emergence of organizations like National Federation of Dalit Women, All India Dalit Women's Forum, Maharashtra Dalit Mahila Sangatna, as well as the celebration of Bharatiya Stri Mukti Divas on 25th December, spearheaded by Dr. Pramila Leela Sampat. Today, the Bahujan Mahila Aghadi and Sheth Mazur Shetkari Shramik Aghadi in Maharashtra struggle over pasture land as well as opposing globalization and Hindutva forces. It is hoped that despite the differences that may exist between mainstream feminist movement and other forms of feminism, they will, be, they will not deter a convergence of women's issues or a united feminist front. Sharmila Regi critiques postmodernists who talk of difference but do not feel the need to convert multiple voices into social relations that can expla explain oppression. By concentrating specifically on differences, feminism in India will reach an impasse just like black feminism did in the West. A greater collaboration will ensure richer and a more nuanced approach to resolving women's problems. Feminist engagement with the Indian state. Feminists have had an ambiguous relationship with, with the state. Initially endorsing the welfareist conception of the state, they considered it as an ally, ally expecting progressive legislations from it. However, in the wake of the half-baked initiatives taken by the state, they soon realized their folly. For instance, with regard to dowry-induced deaths, a law was passed in 1980 recognizing it as a special crime instead of passing it off as suicide. But the evidence needed to prove dowry harassment was not specified, nor was it con considered a cognizable offense leading to the acquittal of the accused in the Sudha Goyal dowry case by the Delhi High Court. It took another round of demonstrations to ensure an amendment recognizing cruelty to wife as cognizable, non bailable offense, punishable by three years imprisonment. Likewise, the vehement anti-rape agitation pushed the introduction of a bill defining categories of custodial rape, specifying punishment of 10 years in jail, mandating trials to be in camera and shifting the onus of proof onto the accused. Yet, it was a disappointment as the technical definition of rape obscured the fact that it was an act of violence. Convictions were rendered impossible as physical signs of forcible entry alone were deemed to be the criteria for sexual assault. Molestation cases were dismissed as eve teasing. The sole focus being on custodial rape, the other forms of rape such as familial rape remain neglected. In addition, it reiterated the paradoxical distinction between the age of consent for married and unmarried girls. For the former, intercourse below the age of 16 would be regarded as statutory rape, while for the later, the limit, age limit would be 15 years. Even the criminal law amendment bill introduced on 19th March 2013 and Sexual Harassment at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act passed on 22nd April 2013 are full of ambiguities and silences on martial rape, rape of Dalit tribal women, victimization of the complainant, sexual violence committed by armed forces, absence of monetary liability of the employer and sexual abuse of men or of transgenders. Moreover, violent crimes against women have often become opportunities for political gains. Parties capitalize on the ensuing public furore and media attention well evident in their antics during the protests against the rape and murder of Sheila Devi in Dabwali, Haryana. Similarly, in Maharashtra, appropriating the feminist agenda against indecent representation of women, the right-wing government launched the Agni Shiksha Manch which regulated morality and working women and working mothers as well as rounding up prostitutes and segregating those found to be HIV positive. After the anti-dowry campaign, feminists realized that the state is deeply embedded in patriarchal ideologies, evident in support it lent to the oppressive institution of family. 
in the aftermath of the Delhi gang rape case, objectionable comments on the conduct of women by politicians and by police seen in Tehel casting operation revealed the prevailing misogynistic mindset raising doubts about the conviction for securing justice for women. Thus, in this module we have seen how the women's movement even in the pre-independence period were not very comfortable with the nationalist movement because the nationalist movement using a sovereign frame and a very patriarchal frame of ideology could not include the women's issues and even in the post independent period we have seen how the state itself became a patriarchal state and therefore it was only since the 1970s that the feminist movements began to grow. The anti-dowry movement, the anti-rape movements and of course the movements that are taking place in today's times regarding civil rights etc. Thus this particular module tries to address and also tries to document the efforts of different movements and different feminist ideologies. Thank you.